So as my team of colleagues here are admitting people into the meeting, we're gonna go ahead and um, get started. As I mentioned earlier, my name is Taif Alexander and I'm the Assistant Dean of Students for Diversity and Leadership Development at Wofford College. Thank you all for joining today's session, Anti-Racism 101, Speaking Truth to Power, where our panelists, Dr. Swindle and ACLU Policy Counsel Claire Chevrier, will utilize a historical lens to demonstrate that while the current resistance in the form of protests taking place in the United States and all over the world um, is in part about police brutality, there is a larger historical more systematic reason for these protests that includes understanding how years of federal, state, and local policies have placed communities of color and black communities in particular um, in the crisis that we face today and calling those policies out for what they are, racist, right? A prerequisite for attending this session and for engaging in anti-racism is understanding um, that our own position in a racist society and what that looks like. So this acknowledgement that an individual can simply opt out of living in white supremacy by saying, oh, like, I'm not racist, um, you have to actively fight against it. So I thank everyone in attendance for committing to that fight. As attendees, you all have had the opportunity to leave questions in um, your registration form for our panelists. However, you can also send questions to our lovely host, Nadia Glover, Wofford's Inclusive Engagement um, Coordinator, privately through the chat feature. And so um, while we are going to attempt to get to everyone's question, we might not have time today to do so, but please do consider coming to Thursday's session as well in the event that your question might be answered there. So after the hour um, and after engaging with our panelists, there will be an opportunity for um, session attendees to engage in breakout sessions based on either a historical lens, mass incarceration lens, or based on being a person of color. There will be um, an anti-racism 101 organizer in each room to help guide these discussions. Um, so I just want you all to be aware of that. I also want you to be aware of the fact that this meeting is being recorded, but the breakout sessions will not be recorded. So additionally, um, the lawyer in me needs to say that any attendee who is engaging in disrespectful, harassing, or racist behavior will be removed from this session and any other sessions going forward. Now I'd like to introduce my friend and ACLU policy counsel, um, Claire Chevrier. Claire is policy counsel at the ACLU of Ohio, where she's responsible for leading their statewide advocacy on bail reform and juvenile justice. Before joining the ACLU of Ohio, Claire worked for a nonprofit in Washington, DC, where she represented youth with special education needs who were in the juvenile and or criminal justice systems. Claire joined the ACLU of Ohio staff because she is committed to dismantling the state sanctioned systems of oppression and violence that create obstacles instead of opportunity for individuals like her previous clients. So thanks Claire for joining us today. Now I will, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say it's an honor to be here. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, now I'm going to yield to my co-moderator, Dr. T, who will introduce our first panelist, Dr. Swindle, so she can kickstart this conversation. All right. Thank you, Dean Taifa, for um, kickstarting it my way. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing both a, a, a former colleague as well as um, somebody who I truly admire in the academy, Dr. Jean Swindle. Dr. Jean Swindle specializes in research on teacher language beliefs, teacher education, and issues facing underserved student populations. After a career as a diplomat, Dr. Swindle left the Foreign Service to become a teacher in Asuncion, Paraguay, later becoming general director of a bilingual school. She was the education department and unit head at Rockford University and coordinated their urban education program and pathways program. Dr. Swindle holds a PhD in instructional leadership with a focus on language learning, assessment and evaluation, and the social and cultural foundations of education from the University of Alabama, 
a master's in secondary ed and a BS in international business with a minor in Spanish. She has served on several Cognia engagement reviews, international accreditation teams for Latin America and the Caribbean, and she regularly presents domestically and internationally on teacher language beliefs and culturally relevant pedagogical practices. Excuse me. Dr. Swindle is an assistant professor in ed educational foundations and special education at ETSU and founding member of the Ralph E. Davis Scholars Leadership Academy, which is a grant funded youth initiative to empower underserved and underrepresented teens in East Tennessee as agents of change and community activism. So Dr. Swindle and Claire as well, thank you both for joining us today as we initiate our um, anti-racism teach-in series for the Walford community. So Dr. Swindle, I want to begin with both um, a highly contextually based yet poignant question of how did we get here? Um, as we look at the protests occurring both domestically and internationally, and the recent, and of course, not at all an exhaustive acknowledgement of these atrocious acts, the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, um, Ahmaud Aubrey, and there are so many others. How do we get here to this conversation of systemic racism, police brutality, and even needing to have a conversation to substantiate that Black Lives Matter in the 21st century in America? Thank you. Thank you all for the community for inviting me. I want to first say that it's complicated and the response is very, very much layered. And before I engage in what just an analysis of in very broad strokes of what we're looking at, for everyone to understand that number one, we live in a society that we have inherited and not created. So as such, we need to understand that there are ways in which we can be active participants in changing what, we may, what may not be adept with our society right now. I realize that this is a very personal, this is a very emotional, this is a very charged issue with everyone, but when we realize that we're in a position where change can come, we can understand that there are possibilities, there are potentialities, and there's power in being able to understand our positionality and what force it has. And, you know, I go back to um, um, Harry Rubenstein, he's the curator of the National Museum of American History, and he said, you know, democracy means everyone can participate. It means that you're sharing power with people you don't know, who you don't understand, who you might not even like. But that's a bargain. And some people over time have been felt, they felt threatened with that notion. And as we know, in US history, even though ideally that's what American democracy has been slated to be, historically, we have been violently against including all groups. As a matter of fact, there's been an exclusion of many groups. And so when we look, for example, at things of like the Kerner reports from 2018, the Kerner report reveals a couple of things that are very interesting. And so number one, that black underemployment and unemployment is higher in 1968 than uh, higher now than it was in 1968, four years after the Civil Rights Amendment was passed. Um, we see that the rates of the, the incarceration rates, which Claire will speak of African-American and black individuals is highest among any other group, and that the wealth gap has also increased. And for those of you who are social science scientists, and I appreciate that many are here, we know that, you know, we, we have this formula that everyone asks, well, why are Black people still in certain positions? What's still going on? Why haven't they done like immigrants? Why haven't they been able to achieve certain things like other populations without understanding historically what some of those constraints were? Because, for example, as an African American, American, my uh, ancestors were not brought here as immigrants. They did not voluntarily choose to cross the Atlantic to come to this nation. And so we have to understand the different conditions and context in which different people arrived in this nation and the constraints and policies that were placed on them in their movement and their participation in democracy and their ability to be mobile within the United States. And so when we take a look and take a look at all of these things, you know, historically we can read, we can know the definitions, we can go through and we can say, wow, how have we gotten here now? And I think about this. I think about the fact that we have John Lewis, who many of you know is a longtime U.S. Uh, representative from Georgia, 80 years old, stage four cancer, 
who appeared in the Black Lives Matter Square because he wanted to be here, and who in 1960, in, in 1968, he was beaten over the head, his skull cracked, his skull cracked. And he's saying, and he's pontificating and saying, you know, when George Floyd was murdered, it reminded me of Emmett Till. Why did that have to happen? And why am I at 80 years old still having to do this? And so we look at some of these contentions and um, we think about historically what has happened. And um, Dr. T knows that I kind of look at things, I absolutely love philosophy and look at it from a, uh, a philosophical perspective and what we have been able to come into understanding as Americans. And the reality is, is that we have um, been told that, listen, we are exceptional. Our country is exceptional. Everything that we do and that we've done has been exceptional. And the reality is, is that we cannot say that when people have been excluded from democratic participation since our onset. And so what it requires is a more nuanced understanding of what that means and how it's come to influence and affect not only generations, but in the, not only individuals, but generations. And even though as social sciences, scientists, we say that in theory, you should be able to move from one socioeconomic position to the next in a generation, which we calculate to be 70 years. That's actually not the case. Not when you have policies that have actually encumbered that on many, many different levels. And so when we go through, and I would like for us to think about historically, I don't want to preach to the choir. I know that many individuals know much about our U.S. history, but I would like to go back to some things written in 19, you know, in the 1970s and 80s. One of the theorists in social sciences, Young, he actually talked about five faces of oppression. And he said, you know, there are three that have to do with labor, which has to do with labor exploitation, labor marginalization, and powerless. And those are actually economic means. It's like, you know, who has been exploited in their labor? Who been marginalized from being able to contribute and have power and how do they become then powerless as far as politics as far as participating in economy, economy is concerned and then he then talks about cultural imperialism what culture is considered superior superior why is it considered superior and who doesn't fall within that and we look at violence and our theories of justice for those of you who, who like to think about fairness our theories of justice fall short. Every theory of justice from realism, idealism, utilitarianism, to even pragmatism, they really fall short when it comes to a country that was established on exploiting labor, marginalizing individuals for centuries from effective, uh, from, from really actually the tenets of well-being. And, and there's been this cultural imperialism that has usurped what they are as individuals. Now, with that, there's a classic error that I continually tell myself as an individual who lives in this society and as someone who visits a lot of places and as I talk to my students, I say, just because an experience has not been your own does not mean it hasn't been someone else's. And so what that does is opens me up to listening a little bit about what other narratives have. As Dr. T mentioned, I was a diplomat at one time and thought that everything, because of my training, my background, everything in America and everything we've done is absolutely fabulous until I had to sit down and listen to colleagues from Nicaragua, colleagues from Paraguay, colleagues from Chile tell, tell me about how American imperialism had instituted certain militaristic regimes and the effect that it had on their families, what it meant for them. And being able to understand and tease those things out helps to bring to red that maybe we don't have all of the story if we're not listening to everyone's story. So to be honest with you, Dr. T, I believe that a lot of where we got to now is listening to the part that makes us feel comfortable, but not really listening to that which makes us feel incredibly uncomfortable. And that which makes us feel incredibly comfortable from a policy standpoint, from a societal standpoint, from where I choose to live, where I send my kids to school, where I go to church, where I choose to eat, where I, you know, who I choose to follow on my social media outlets actually is very, very personal, but it really is indicative of a lot of what we are looking at as far as some of where we are now. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that response, Dr. Swindle, to that question. 
And you, you mentioned violence, right? And I want to talk a little bit about that um, and, and put it within, shape it within the context of um, the, the protests that are currently going on. So knowing this history that you just elaborately described and how Blacks have been pathologized in America, I want us to revisit the aforeman aforementioned subject of protests. So the last article that I read by Reuters shared that a protest has taken place in all 50 states, more than 40 countries, and on every continent except for Antarctica. So as popular as the protests have been in their demands for justice and equality, they've also come under much scrutiny and critique as protesters have been preferred, referred to as thugs, looters, and even in some cases, criminals. Your research focuses a lot on the power and divisiveness of language. So can you speak to how something with an aim to bring an awareness to unjust acts that have taken place, such as a protest, um, how can that bring about so much violence and lead to the language choice that I just aforementioned? Thank you. That is an excellent question. And in the words of one of our great uh, folk linguists, Dr. Lee, uh, language is never neutral. Language is invoked and language is wielded in powerful ways in very different situations. So for example, even though we're living in a time when many statues and monuments to, Dr. to Robert E. Lee are being torn down, if I were to invoke, you know what, our greatest leader in US history was Robert E. Lee, then that is going to invoke so many feelings from so many different people because in US history, we actually have a narrative. We tend to theorize and glorify everything. Our American exceptionalism tells us that these were, that this looting done during Robert E. Lee's time was done because it was necessary, it was right, and it was helping to make us great. And so being able to understand that when we take a look at looters and, 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 and the terms that are invoked, looters, rioters, protesters. I like to go to like the words of Paulo Freire, and Freire says something very, very important. He broke it down, those of you who know him and know him, in the Brazilian context of a lot of injustice that has been done in very classist, very racialized system akin to what we live in the U.S. Freire said, you know, any type of oppression, any type of domination, any type of squashing down a little bit is violence in itself even if it's done by the most, you know, the least drastic means. So one of the questions that I always have, and I look because I've looked at our news sources, and it's interesting to me that we see that everyone's saying that we are asking for peaceful protests, and then that's being underscored, peaceful protest. And, um, excuse me, I think my landlord has come to clean something at the very wrong time, so I'm going to plug in my microphone. But we see that those are some very, very interesting words and terminologies to use because one of the questions that I have is that, have you even considered the violence that provoked the protest to begin with? And we're not just talking about one act. We're not talking about the death of George Floyd. We're actually talking about branding, killing, mutilating black bodies, writing a narrative on them that says that you deserve less than what any citizen in the U.S. deserves. Right before here, uh, before this, I was looking at some of the comments from George Floyd's, Floyd's uh, funeral, and I imagine that Claire will actually be able to speak to this also, but I am appalled at the fact that people are saying, how can you um, honor this criminal, this lifelong criminal, criminal? And then I say, you know, that is violence in itself because let's say that I am a lifelong criminal who's walking to the store and because of the color of my skin, and for no other reason than the color of my skin, I am walking to the store. I am the victim of excessive police force because there's a narrative already written on my body that is a hegemonic narrative that they believe from before I was born and something that has prevailed in our society. So we actually cannot say that violence has been occurring. And unfortunately, when you do not address violent behavior that provokes protests, you are going to have other violence. Violence begets violence. So it's interesting to me that there's this narrative and what is being done now is wielded as a way of saying, hmm, let us go and let us say 
The good protesters are the black people who protest quietly, who protest peacefully, who do that. And that in itself is exacting some type of moral, a certain, some type of ethical judgment on what is good and what is bad. Yet, we're not looking at what policies are good and bad and the way in which our society is constructed for us to be able to confront this to begin with. Thank you for that response as well, Dr. Swindle. It's greatly appreciated. I, I have one um, final question for you before I yield the floor to Dean T and, and Claire. And that's, and this is, I, and I know you may not have all the answers right now for this one or uh, have to think about it some more. Um, but that is, where do we go from here? You know, Angela Davis once said that radical simply means grasping things at the root. So while the protesting, cry, protesting and cries for justice and equality are promulgated across the country and world, what do we need to be grasping at the root in order to move forward? That is a good question. It's a deep question, and it's one that is multi-layered because we have to look at it. There are a number of us here, and we have to attack this on the personal level. We have to see what are our spheres of influence and where can we make a difference. And we have to see what are we doing at the policy level and what are we doing on the national level to make sure that we can actually uh, do something that our nation hasn't done very well. And when it comes to such inequality, it has to do with how can we actually take a look at this? How can we redress it? How can we respond to it? And what can we do to be able to re-educate? So our involvement as a democratic society instead of integration has not done a very good job of seeing what needs to be done. I can involve someone in what I'm doing. I can invite someone to participate in a panel. I can invite someone to participate in my organization, but I can silence them and I can limit them from the very start. So what we've done sometimes in our history is we've involved people of color, we have involved women, but we have not integrated them and integrated their thoughts and their thought processes within that. Why is that important? Because we haven't done the redress, was, was to remedy and set right what was wrong. We haven't looked at restoration in the terms that we could have restoring what uh, we belong to others, to something, to, to the owner is former conditions. We can see that in our indigenous cultures in this country. And we haven't looked at re-education. So when all of this research and all of this data are telling us that people are still racist in America, why are not we unlearning some of this and replacing it with correct knowledge? And so we have to do a little bit better job in that. And at the personal level, I have to, in Jean Swindle's life, I have to antagonate and question myself every single day. And it's hard, it's laborious. You know what, it's, a, it's, it's work, but I need to do it. And say to myself, Jean, are you participating in any racist behavior? And many of you may look at me as an African-American and say, oh my gosh, what do you mean? Of course you can be racist as an African-American. Of course you can be racist as a marginalized individual. If you are supporting racist institutions, practices, and thought processes, and they are affecting the way in which you are interacting with other individuals, of course. And so what does that mean? And starting at that level and then seeing collectively how I, within my sphere of influence, in this setting, in my community activism, as a researcher, even um, outside of the US, what am I doing to be able to promote anti-racist policies? And also seeing as a citizen of this country, what am I doing to make sure that anti-racist policies are ones, that racist policies are being disbanded and anti-racist policies are the ones that are being promoted? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Swindle, for that note. And now I will yield to Dean Taifa and Claire. Dr. Swindle, thank you so much for those comments. Um, we're now going to transition to our panelist, Claire Chevrier, ACLU of Ohio policy lawyer for her insights. Counselor, thank you again for taking the time to be with us this afternoon. As we heard Dr. Swindle allude to in her responses, the resistance that we're seeing in forms of protests um, that have been gaining momentum across the country and 
all over the world should be contextualized in this 400 plus year history and refinement of interconnected systems of oppression that operate to restrict opportunities for people of color and black people in particular living in the United States. All of which led up to the recent police killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so, so, so many others. In your opinion, Claire, what role, if any, does the school to prison pipeline, mass incarceration, um, the prison industrial complex play in the interconnected systems of oppression and more specifically into protesters rallying cries now heard around the world of Black Lives Matter? Absolutely. And thank you so much for inviting me to be here. I feel so grateful to listen and learn and that this space was created. And I'm so excited by how many people chose to spend their afternoon this way. So I'm going to quickly, as quickly as possible, go over mass incarceration and prison industrial complex and the school to prison pipeline. And I think what's important to recognize here is that so many practices that we take as commonplace, that we just accept, are actually vehicles of oppression. And even and it's become so entrenched and all of these systems are such outgrowths of oppressive, sometimes de jure or by law racist practices, that in fact, even some of the reforms that we create to try to make these practices better actually end up bolstering instead of eradicating the oppressive structures. So when we talk about mass incarceration, what we're talking about is the fact that in this country, crime rates have actually drastically decreased, but we're seeing an increase in the number of people behind bars in both jails and prisons. And there are a number of different reasons why we're seeing that. So one of those reasons is our country's over-reliance on cash bail. So not every jurisdiction, some places have uh, undergone bail reform, but in many jurisdictions across the United States, if you are arrested, you will be required to post a sum of money as a condition of release. And that would either be based on a bond schedule that just says, if you're arrested for this, you got to pay this amount or after seeing a judge. And the only constitutionally sanctioned purpose of cash bail is to provide an incentive for somebody to come back to court. But unfortunately, what we see is actually it turns into wealth based detention that for somebody who's not able to post this amount of bail, they end up just staying in jail. And this has enormous personal consequences. For somebody who uh, remains in jail pretrial, they increase their likelihood of losing their job, losing their homes, even losing custody of their children. If you think of it in the context of college students, like if you were arrested for something today that you did or didn't do, and you couldn't pay for your bail, like would somebody know to feed your cat or dog? You know, what would your work do when you didn't show up the next day? How could staying in jail maybe just for one night, maybe for six months, affect your life. And what we're seeing is this is done just based on who has resources and who doesn't have resources. We also know that this makes a mockery of the entire criminal justice system because we know that cash bail then, if it's requiring somebody to remain in jail, creates huge coercive structures uh, that force people to uh, plead guilty or uh, get convicted of something that they didn't do or that they otherwise could have fought. So for example, if somebody's held in jail pretrial, they're more likely to be convicted and their sentences are two to three times longer than somebody who's arrested for the same thing but is able to purchase their release. And that's because it's a lot harder to build your case from behind bars. You're not able to provide mitigation evidence during sentencing of all the great things you've been doing for the last three months to show the judge that you're a good person because instead all of those opportunities have been denied to you because you've been in jail. But also, we know that in this country, 90% of convictions are not made by going to trial like you see in Law and Order. They're made via plea deals. And we know that people often feel coerced into taking plea deals, and that that coercion is heightened if somebody is being held in jail. For many misdemeanors, if you take a plea deal today, it means you can sleep in your own bed. But if you want to fight for your innocence, maybe you'll spend the next three months in jail waiting to demonstrate that you didn't do it. So people who don't have the means to purchase their release, and I hope that when you, when you put it in the context of buying your freedom, you realize the historical problem here of maybe what the actual purpose of cash bail is and to keep people behind bars. There's also lots of problems with different legislators, you know, changing what certain crimes are listed as. It's the state legislature that chooses whether something's a misdemeanor or whether something's a felony. Obviously, certain things are always going to be felonies, some of the more severe crimes. 
but there are a lot of crimes that are on the edge and a state legislature can choose whether or not a certain crime means you could go to prison for four years or 10. Um, and that's problematic as far as just legislators who might not understand the law, might not be lawyers, are just changing laws every day that keep more people in prison and jail for longer. Right now in Ohio, there's a, a bill pending that would make it uh, a more severe crime if you sell drugs within 100 feet of a rehabilitation center. But it doesn't require you to know that you were near a rehabilitation center. Most rehabilitation centers don't list themselves as rehabilitation center to protect the anonymity of their patients. So people could unknowingly active, uh, sell drugs near this facility and then spend many more years in prison if this passes. And if you pay attention to state legislators, you'll, legislatures, you'll see that these kinds of bills are pending and pass all the time. Now the prison industrial complex is this understanding that of prison as a, a model to make money. So across the country, prisons, both private prisons and state prisons, uh, use forced labor to create things for companies, for businesses, but even for states. Uh, in Ohio, at the beginning of the pandemic, our governor announced like, don't worry guys, we're gonna get prisoners to make masks. Um, and people are like, oh, that's great, because we need masks. But it's incredibly problematic if you put it in the context of these people are being forced to engage in this labor, often against their will, and usually are only provided pennies on the dollar as compensation. We also know that there are different companies that benefit off of people being in prison. For example, uh, I've been spending this pandemic suing ICE to try to get medically vulnerable people out of detention. And in order to contact my clients, which is problematic for other reasons, I've been having to uh, pay to call them through this company called IC Solutions. It costs like $15 for a video conference for 30 minutes, it costs uh, a certain amount of money per minute. Uh, and uh, to add money to your account, it's like a $15 fee just to add the money and that doesn't even apply to the amount that I have on it. This is a corporation that is making a tremendous amount of money off of the fact that we are holding people behind bars. And there's also a jail contract. So not every county or municipality in the country has its own jail or prison. So instead, they have to contract with a different locality that has a jail or prison. And sometimes those contracts look like, you know, a flat fee. Sometimes it looks like having to pay per person. Uh, but the problem there is, if you're paying a, a certain amount that's maybe the equivalent of 10 people, you might want to get those 10 people, you want to get your money's worth. There are different contracts that provide incentives for communities to incarcerate their people. Uh, and then quickly to talk about the school to prison pipeline before I pivot to kind of some of the reform efforts that have really failed in these areas. We know that uh, in public schools across the country, and we know this because of the civil rights data collection that the uh, Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights does every few years, that students of color are overwhelmingly disproportionately punished for subjective misbehaviors as opposed to objective misbehaviors. So white students get suspended or expelled for fighting, for graffiti, for uh, cursing. But students of color and mostly uh, black students get in trouble instead for subjective misbehaviors like disobedience. And when pressed, teachers will say, well, they rolled their eyes. You know, so things that in, are not actually representative of a student's misbehavior, but of a teacher's interpretation or biases being reflected in the way that they're, they're choosing to carry out punishment. So that's a kind of quick and dirty mass incarceration, prison industrial complex, school to prison pipeline. Uh, and the ways in which all of these different policies that we kind of take as commonplace, like cash bail, are in fact working to keep people out of their communities and in cages. And this is all within the structure of we know that communities of color are over-policed um, for things that white communities get away with all the time, and that communities of color are more likely to be arrested for things they have not done. And so they're more likely to enter the system regardless of culpability or innocence or guilt. And that these structures are then in place to keep certain in individuals in this pipeline. So what are some of, so what are some of these 
reforms. So one of the things that people have been working on is like how to remove you know, racial bias from judges. We know judges are humans. We know everyone has implicit, if not explicit biases. How can we make the criminal justice system and the pretrial system specifically more fair? So one of the things that, you know, rose in popularity over the last few years is this idea of computer algorithm risk assessments. So instead of a judge looking at someone and determining whether or not they're a risk to society, instead a computer will make that decision. And that was kind of exciting at, for reformers at first, this idea that, you know, it would be an objective decision based on a computer that couldn't possibly be racist. And so lots of jurisdictions across the country spent money developing these tools, buying these tools, working with nonprofits to get these tools. And ultimately what we know is they don't work. And the reason they don't work is because even if the computer system is spitting out the final numbers, the inputs still come from the racist criminal legal system. So for example, with risk assessments, one of the factors that some of them use is, are you from a high crime neighborhood? Well, that's just a direct criminalization of poverty. So some of them don't look at that. They recognize that's a bad factor. Some of them look at arrest, not conviction, but arrest. We know that that just speaks to police choices, police bias. And we know that communities of color are more likely to be over-policed and they're more likely to get arrested for things that they have not done. So some don't look at arrests but all of them look at convictions. But what I just said is true, that 90% of convictions are made via plea deal, that, that plea deals are coerced in situations, especially where cash bail exists, but also where people have limited resources to defend themselves, that they're more likely to take a plea deal for something that they have not done. And so ultimately, even convictions are more a representation of the police decision-making, the prosecutor's decision to stack charges, and whether or not they had the means to carry out their defense or even to remain in jail long enough to be able to carry out their defense. So in fact, even though it's a so-called objective computer, they're in fact taking all of their inputs from the racist criminal legal system and turning something out that reflects those racial biases. And now uh, jurisdictions across the country have these risk assessments and they're being used. There's also some new evidence coming out that uh, judges will look at a risk assessment to, uh, for cover to hold people, but will not actually use them to release people if the risk assessment says that somebody is not a risk. There's also incidents with, uh, so another reform used in education is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So the IDEA was created first in 1975 under a different name. And it's what provides people with uh, special education protections. And uh, originally, it was, it's an education bill, but it was also talked as a, about as a civil rights bill, that the IDEA would help make sure that students with special education needs would not be warehoused in other facilities, but to the extent possible, remain in the classroom environment with peers. And so the IDEA now in its current iteration has a bunch of different categories for, for, that students can fall on into. And depending on what category you're in, you could get different accommodations that can help you with school. So for example, if you have dyslexia, you might get more time on exams. You might get different uh, accommodations for larger text or whatever it is that based on your individualized need, you need in order to succeed. Unfortunately, you only have to get tested in the areas that your teacher has some concern that you might need help in. And so what we see is, even though this law was created to bring people back, to include people in the public education sphere, what we see is when young white students misbehave in kindergarten, preschool, first grade, second grade, they get the full range of tests. And, they, and their school learns that in fact, this student's not a behavior problem. They're dyslexic. They, that's why they are misbehaving every day in reading class. We're gonna give them these tools. We're gonna support them. And now this student is able to learn how to read. With students of color, overwhelmingly, and again, we see this from the civil rights data collection, they're miscategorized. They're not provided the full range of tests. Instead, students of color are disproportionately placed in the emotional behavioral disturbance category, which is a really bad name for this category, but that's what it is, and uh, in intellectual disability categories. 
And so what that means is, as a student's growing up, if these two youth who have uh, dyslexia, one of them is given every single accommodation necessary. They've got extra time. They're gonna get extra time on the LSAT and on the bar exam, whatever it is that they do. The other student might never learn how to read because it's really hard to learn how to read if you're dyslexic and are never told that you're dyslexic and never given the tools necessary to succeed. And so even this law that was created to help students is being carried out in a way that actually further separates uh, and like wrongfully demonstrates that, you know, this person is, was always going to succeed and this person was always going to be a behavioral problem. And it's actually bolstering the oppressive systems instead of eradicating it. Thanks, Claire. Um, that's a lot to take in. Sorry. <laughs> Um, just because we talked about the history, right, and, and Dr. Swindle emphasized very heavily about policies and making sure that, you know, our policies aren't creating racist systems, but as we hear from you, even with the implement implementation of race-neutral policies, which you and I have issues with, um, that there is still this technically racially biased result, right? And it's impacting and having long lasting effects on how um, we approach equity and um, ensuring an anti-racist system. I did want to pivot a little bit to um, another type of policy as it relates to policing, because a lot of people have been saying, you know, that um, officers, all officers aren't bad. And that Officer Chauvin, um, who was responsible for placing his knee on George Floyd's neck for over eight minutes, right, um, was just an example of a bad apple. What are your takes on that? Sure, so kind of two questions. One, this idea of race neutrality in our law is somewhat BS. Uh, and here's why. So let's take an example outside of the criminal legal system uh, that many people are aware of, the GI Bill. So the GI Bill was created uh, during World War II to help uh, soldiers have a safety net when they were coming back from war. And the GI Bill is totally race neutral, which by that I mean it doesn't say, and this only applies to white soldiers. It, it's supposed to apply to everyone, or at least that's what the text suggests. The first problem is we know that Legislators at the time went on the book saying that they did as much as possible to make sure that it would not apply to black soldiers returning home from war. So even though the text is racially neutral, there were a number of things that legislators purposely did to make that not the case, including make it sure that states are who dished out the funding instead of it coming from the federal government. Um, but also, we know that in practice, even if something's race neutral, its outcome isn't necessarily race neutral. So the GI Bill provided uh, lower interest rates for mortgage buying for, coming home, for soldiers coming home and uh, education opportunities um, and tuition funding. But we know that uh, in the Army at the time, black soldiers were often dishonorably discharged for the same misbehavior that white soldiers were honorably discharged for. And if you were dishonorably discharged, the GI Bill didn't apply to you. So immediately, it didn't apply to a large group of black soldiers that it did apply, but it did apply to white soldiers. We also know that at the time that this law was created, there were restrictive, racially restrictive covenants across the country, which means that communities would say, black families or other families of color are not allowed to buy a home here. And we know that the GI Bill for white families ended up creating opportunities for massive amassing of wealth. You know, there are families who bought a $20,000 home in Long Island under the GI Bill that they can now sell for $2 million. And that's a huge amassing of wealth. It also provided, you know, stability and good schooling and a safe community for all of that time between now and uh, the 1940s. But at the time, those racially restrictive covenants stopped families of color from buying in those communities, from, from being able to purchase larger homes when they were coming back from war. And so we know that even though it was race neutral, it wasn't applied in a race neutral way. But we also know that the outcome of that so-called race neutral law then has huge effects now. There was actually 
uh, a study done that demonstrated that the uh, the uh, Great Recession negatively affected families of color more than white families, in large part because of the GI Bill, because many white families had already paid off mortgages uh, back from when they were able to benefit under the GI Bill, uh, that families of color were not able to, based on not being able to have access to this same law at the time. Uh, and so this is the same way as, you know, risk assessments are technically race neutral, except they're getting information from the biased criminal legal system. So what they're churning out is similarly biased. To answer the second point, uh, but to answer the second point about uh, whether or not, you know, this one police officer Of a, police of a police office that has undergone so many different kinds of reform. You know, I'm pulling up my, my list. The Minneapolis Police Department has mandatory implicit bias trainings, mandatory de-escalation trainings, mandatory crisis intervention trainings. They created community dialogues. They have police cams, which lots of advocates recognize are not that helpful. And they have a black police chief. You know, they have consciously undergone what advocates have been saying is necessary for reform. And clearly that has not worked. And that's because there are so many different structures that exist right now that cause police systems to be vehicles of violence. And it is not possible to reform a group that has its roots in slave patrols. That, you know, mandatory bias training does not help. And that does not mean that the individual who you know and love who's a police officer is a bad person. It means that the structures that we have allowed to continue create a dangerous environment for police uh, and for communities that have police presence. And so here are three examples. One, we've been hearing a lot about the militarization of police. So the militarization of police means that the federal government is allowed to give excess military equipment to local police departments. And this means, and on a lot of times they're, it's done conditionally that the local police department has to recognize, has to demonstrate that they're gonna use the equipment. And this has led to a drug blast in California being responded to with tanks. It's led to a baby being badly burned by a grenade when police entered their home and didn't even find any of what they were looking for. You know, the militarization of police is kind of like giving, giving people this very terrifying vehicle of violence toy and saying you need to demonstrate that you're going to use it or you're going to lose it. So there's also police unions and police unions have incredible political power and uh, many of the different police unions have police contracts that officers are not allowed to be fired unless there's mandatory arbitration. So often when you see that somebody's been put on administrative leave, it might be because their boss thinks they're dangerous, thinks they shouldn't have a weapon, thinks they need to be off the street, but their hands are tied under contracts and they are not allowed to fire this individual. There's also qualified immunity. So qualified immunity is uh, a, a created by case law, so by judges, and it creates basically an impossible standard, which makes it nearly impossible to uh, sue a police officer in their personal capacity to get money back. So for example, if Dean Alexander punched me right now, uh, you know, I could try to press charges criminally, but I could also sue her civilly to try to get money. For example, my, my medical bills as a result of having been punched. You wouldn't be getting much, Claire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if a police officer punches me, there's almost nothing that you can do, and that's because of this doctrine of, of qualified immunity. And so some examples, um, of stories and case law that have been found to not, not pass this bar of qualified immunity. It's a police officer allowed the police dog to maul a homeless person, even after it was determined that the homeless person did not fit the description whatsoever of the suspect, that was determined to be fine. Qualified immunity barred that person from getting, uh, from, from getting any money from that police officer. Qualified immunity allowed a police officer, again, this goes to the militarization of police, completely damaged a home to the point that it was no longer, uh, you were no longer able to live in it, using explosives and grenades, even though it turned out that they didn't have a correct warrant to be going into that home in the first place. 
the person was not able to get any money back from the police because of this doctrine of qualified immunity. So again, it doesn't mean that the officer who you personally know is or isn't a bad person. It means that they're working for this oppressive and often corrupting system of violence that so protects these officers that they are told that it doesn't matter what happens, what you do, what level of force you respond with, it is almost impossible for you to get fired because of these police contracts or be held accountable in civil court. And as we know, and hopefully these protests are shifting here, uh, but we also know that often police officers get away with lying in police reports. We know that uh, this police report did not specify that a knee hold was used until video evidence showed up later. So police are very protected. They don't have to tell the truth in their police reports because they're not gonna get fired and they're usually not gonna get arrested. And they're not gonna be held accountable in civil court and they're given grenades in some of these local jurisdictions and told that they have to use them. And so it, it's a corrupting structure and it needs to change. And any amount of you know, anti-bias trainings or de-escalation trainings are not gonna overcome what we know exists in that structure. Thanks, Claire. So as we wrap up here, as a lawyer with the ACLU of Ohio working on policy reform, um, as it relates to bail and juvenile justice, what is it that we can do as attendees of this anti-racism teaching in our families, within our communities, uh, among our friend groups, at our jobs, and, and in our overall academic pursuits to dismantle these systems of oppression to create opportunities for and contribute to the safety of Black lives. Absolutely. So I think what's so important here and what I hope that uh, this conversation has made clear is that these structures are so deeply rooted that, you know, white individuals choosing to be kind to everyone that they know and choosing to hash it out with a frustrating relative once a year at, during Thanksgiving or even consciously trying to, you know, bring in diversity during hiring decisions. None of those things touch white supremacy. None of those things even begin to dismantle the oppressive structures that exist. They're necessary. They should be non-negotiables, but they don't change anything. We have to actively be fighting for policy change. We have to actively be looking at these structures that we might take as commonplace, that we might not think of as racist until we think about them critically, and then work to dismantle them. You know, this is just a very short list of one that could go on for millions of pages, but we need bail reform. We need mixed income housing. We need to fundamentally change how the police operate in this country. We need more equitable um, funding for education. You know, we need to get rid of collateral sanctions. We need to end for-profit prisons and profiteering. We need to recognize and eradicate our own implicit biases. And there are a lot of different ways that we can be doing this, you know, sure. We need to be going to city planning meetings. We need to be testifying in our state legislature. You know, if you call your, uh, if you call your uh, U.S. Congress person, you're probably going to get an intern, and your information, and your information is going to get inputted into a spreadsheet, and that's important, and you should do it. If you call your state legislator, you're probably going to get the same person every time. It might be the only time that they've gotten a call that day, that week, or that legislative session, and you're going to have more clout. So you also need to be fighting on a local level in state politics and in county politics. But we also need to be changing hearts and minds. Um, and when we do that, you know, it's important to look at there being a spectrum, right? There's people who are very far away from us who are not going to change their ways. But there's a lot of people in the middle who with education or with conversation might change their ways. And it might be important for you to get to them first. And then there's a lot of people who might think like you. And so while it might not be important to, you know, hash it out with a frustrating uncle at Thanksgiving because you're not going to change their mind, maybe it's important to still hash it out so that you are not normalizing their behavior in front of your nieces and nephews. You need to speak up every single time you see these structures, but it's not enough to just see something, say something. You have to be digging and looking so that you have a better understanding of what these oppressive structures are so that you can start to dig them up. Thank you so much, Claire. And I think a lot of the things that you said um, have informed or will inform the discussions that we'll have on Thursday as well.
So I wanna say thank you so much to both of our panelists. Um, we did not receive any questions um, from this live audience, but um, there was a question that Dr. Swindle, we wanted to ask you. And the question is, how does colorism from a Latin American context impact anti-Black Latinx racism and discrimination within the United States? And since we're a little pressed for time, um, if you can answer in about a minute, it'll be helpful. Thank you. Um, quickly, one of the things that we have to realize is that for areas of the world that have been colonized, colorism is a problem and it always has been a problem. It's actually been a legacy of, uh, colorism has been a legacy that has been left not only in Latin America, the Caribbean, the United States, but in Asia, as well as the Middle East. And one of the aspects of it is to be able to realize this, realize that it is a hegemonic narrative that need not be reinforced and be able to tease out how that affects individuals. Affects individuals because what we are doing is we're imprinting and saying, listen, white is good, white is better, white is best, and it is not. To be able to resist that so that we don't end up reifying some of the narratives and reifying some of the racist colors is isms actions upon our own bodies and those are within people in our community and be able to see themselves as not something as a horizontal hostility but being an ally and recognizing that these are ills within our society that we have inherited and that we need to actively counter thank you so um I just wanted to take this time to recognize the organizers of these anti-racism sessions. So Dr. Jim Neighbors, Dr. Rhiannon Liebrecht, Dr. Camille Bethay, Dr. Kim Rossman, Dr. Kimberly Hall, Dr. Tasha Smith-Tyus, Professor Jessica Scott Felder, uh, Tierra Moni, and our lovely host, Nadia Glover. Um, as colleagues, we have committed to hosting these virtual series throughout the summer and look forward to seeing you all there. In the meantime, we curated a list of resources that may be helpful to you over the course of the summer in developing your anti-racism skills further. And I'll have our, our host drop that information before we all go. But um, this concludes the panel and Q&A portion of the program. So for those of you who indicated you wanted to engage in the optional breakout discussions, our hosts will begin that process now. And the breakout groups were based on your responses to the RSVP form and uh, availability of those groups. And so in the breakout rooms, you'll have up to 30 minutes to debrief and discuss this session. And after your discussion, your anti-racism organizer assigned to that room will dismiss you. So thank you all for coming. And I really, really enjoyed the discussion. And thank you again to Claire and Dr. Swindle for engaging in this discussion with us. Okay, everyone. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the breakout rooms at this time. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope you have a great afternoon.